Today, we're talking about the origins of the sportscast, and I know some of you like me to go way, way, way back, so I thought I would show this Mesoamerican uh, picture from the Metropolitan Museum of Art from the first century BCE, and uh, a scholarly article. This is actually the follow-up to a scholarly article called Baseball in the Stone Age, and we all know the communications goes back there also. Uh, we, there were signal fires, smoke signals, things of that nature. And by the way, a PDF of these slides is already available at bit.ly slash SC, as in Shubin Cafe, hyphen sportscast. And I'll put that link up again at the end. So the first U.S. televised real sports, and I'll explain what I mean by real sports, were in 1939, starting with a baseball game at uh, Baker Field in Manhattan. It was Princeton versus Columbia. And then a little bit later in Brooklyn, uh, the network presentation of the Cincinnati Reds versus the Brooklyn Dodgers at Ebbets Field. And it was not necessarily a totally successful uh, venture. Here's the report in the New York Times the next day. Starts with blur, but images came clear later. Players are like flies. Spectators at screen unable to follow action, but the announcer tells the story. And by the way, there were truck parking problems even back then. This is from the uh, FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park. And it's a letter from the head of television at NBC. And he's saying that uh, because someone wouldn't let them park their television trucks at the polo grounds, they're not going to show a football game. Instead, they're going to show fencing and who knows, maybe you'll like that. But the U.S. was not the first to do televised sports casts. This is a uh, link to a presentation that was uh, just posted two days ago, the Royal Television Society in London, and it's called the uh, televising the 1948 Olympics, but in fact, it's got much more than that. And uh, this image from the BBC website about the Wimbledon uh, tennis match being first televised in 1937. In fact, from 1937 to 1939, the BBC carried just about every sport that was played in the UK. They even had uh, one time with a, a camera put into a swimming pool to show some swimming. But that wasn't the first either, because a year before that, the uh, Olympics in Berlin, this is 85 years ago, uh, were televised and they had uh, three iconoscope cameras and they had one uh, image dissector camera. And then they had this strange thing at the upper left. It was an intermediate film system. So they had a film camera and you can see the supply reel at the top of the camera, but there was no take up reel. Instead, the film went down through the pedestal into a processing laboratory in the truck and then was televised. And in the middle is a video projector that was used. And at the right is one of the viewing halls where people came to watch the Olympics on television. But that wasn't the first because five years before that, 90 years ago, um, John Logie Baird televised the Derby in uh, the UK. And slightly before that, there was a baseball game that was televised in Tokyo. Uh, so we have actual sports being televised as early as 1931. Before that, the reason that I was talking about real sports before, if you look at the picture in the upper right, this is on one of the roofs at uh, what's now called West Beth. It was Bell Telephone Laboratories just south of the High Line in Manhattan. And you can see one of the engineers swinging a tennis racket in front of a television camera there. He also sometimes swung a uh, golf club. Uh, but that wasn't real sports. That was just showing the possibilities. In 1922, there was a magazine cover that was talking about television. And here we see a baseball sports cast. And then in 1878, in Punch's Almanac, uh, there's this spoof on something that they called Edison's telephonoscope, and it was supposedly a video phone call, but it happens to be a badminton game that's uh, being played. So um, that's the earliest television in 1928, and even that was uh, not real sports. 
So what is going on here? Here we have Cleveland pitcher and manager Bob Lemon, and he's being inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, and he gives a speech, and he says that shortly after he was born in 1920, he was taken to an opera house in Redlands, California by his mother because his mother had to watch the World Series. Well, the World Series was being played thousands of miles away. How did she watch the game live in 1920? And here's a book about the 1919 World Series, the uh, scandalous World Series where the game was thrown. And Arnold Rothstein, the uh, gambler who uh, maybe arranged for it to be thrown, went to see the signal that the fix was in. And he did that in New York, which was, again, not where the game was being played. And witnesses said that what he was looking at was almost like being there. And how about this New York Times story even earlier? This is in 1914. It's a story by Joyce Kilmer. We know Joyce Kilmer mostly as a rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike and the author of the poem Trees, but he was also a reporter for the New York Times. And he wrote that Sir James Matthew Barry. Uh, changed rooms at the Knickerbocker Hotel so he could spend hours breathlessly watching the baseball game. Barry was the author of Peter Pan. And here's the Knickerbocker Hotel in Times Square, which is nowhere near the ball field. So what was he watching? Well, he said he was spending many hours breathlessly watching the ball of light speed across the mimic diamond. And this is something that was set up in Times Square called the Star Ball Player. And it was a way to watch the game. And here it is in operation. This is just a, a very short clip, a few seconds over and over again. This is from some film that was found in a dump in uh, Dawson, uh, where it was cold enough that it didn't deteriorate much. And this is at the National Archives in Canada. Uh, but you can see the ball moving around. You can see the runner approaching second base, the ball being thrown to try to get him out and so on. Um, so that's in 1919. Scientific American actually talked about the star ball player in 1913 and many other systems. Uh, here's the 1911 World Series being viewed in Times Square by many thousands of people. And then just eight blocks south, there's even more people in Herald Square, where the crowd was estimated as at 70,000. That's in addition to the thousands who were in Times Square. The capacity at the ballpark where the game was being played was only 34,000. And there were so many people in Herald Square that a shop owner sued uh, saying his business was completely destroyed because no one could get it anywhere near his shop. So let's go back even farther. There were approximately twin births around 1845. The date is really wrong for both of them, uh, but the uh, National Baseball Hall of Fame uh, talks about the Knickerbocker rules adopted in 1845 as being uh, the rules of a recognizable baseball game, really the rules that Doc Adams came up with in 1857 or probably closer to that. And uh, Samuel Finley Brees Morse uh, comes up with the telegraph in 1845. Actually, he did work before that, and there were telegraph systems way before that, too. But it's a start. And in 1846, the Associated Press got organized, which meant that a newspaper didn't have to send a reporter to a remote game. They could get a reporter from a local newspaper to report it for them. In 1851, Western Union provided telegraph service all over, so you didn't have to contract with different telegraph companies. And in 1860, uh, railroads uh, linked just about every city where anyone wanted to play baseball. And the great uh, baseball historian Peter Mara says there's good reason to believe that the railroads saved baseball. And note that here are two images. They're both taken from Hoboken, New Jersey. The top one is the introduction of the railroad to America at Castle Point. The bottom one is the first um, game played under those Knickerbocker rules between opposing teams. Uh, actually, the first game was in 1845. This is a, a lithograph from 1866. But notice how close these two things are. Here's uh, Castle Point over here, and there's the Elysian Fields. So uh, spitting distance, really, between the two of them. 
And then in 1875, we have the first sports bar. Actually, this image is the 1876 Democratic National Convention, which was at the St. Louis Merchants Exchange Building, but a block away at Massey's Billiard Hall, they had a blackboard and they had scores telegraphed to them every half inning. And other bars had scores only every inning. So Massey's was considered the place to be. And so it begins, and it starts in 1884 in Nashville at the Masonic Theater, um, where they had a telegraph operator at the game, a telegraph operator at the Masonic Theater who was receiving the plays and announcing them, and they had some sort of a uh, board. Uh, you can see a story from a year later in Augusta, Georgia, where they talk about a, a blackboard with holes in it, and they put little uh, flags in the holes to indicate who's on base and uh, what's going on. In 1886, in Atlanta at the Gives Opera House, that's the headline that you see down at the bottom, they actually painted a baseball diamond on the stage, and they got some boys to reproduce whatever the play was. And then in 1886, the telegraph operators who came up with the system in 1884 in Nashville started going on tour around the country. And now they've got a couple of years under their belts, and they've discovered that they can work the crowd. So uh, they're talking about here in the Detroit Free Press how they work the crowd up to a very high pitch of enthusiasm. For instance, when the operator read, with Dalrymple's name appearing as Betzman, foul fly to left, the audience fairly held its breath. And then when the next instant the operator called out, and out to white, there came a storm of applause just such as is heard on a veritable ball field. That was the beginning of sportscast type choreography or language. Now, outdoors, uh, this is 1888, a crowd of 6,000 blocks traffic on the Brooklyn Bridge when the uh, sun puts up this system for people to watch the game. And the patents uh, that were later filed for this earned enough money to buy a controlling interest in the Boston Post. There were improvements. The first system you see on the left, all they had was a uh, board with holes that uh, little pegs could be put into that indicated the name of who was at that base. But uh, by 1889, they added motion. You can see cranks up at the top here. And that's for four possible players. And so you can see where they are between bases and so on. And in 1891, they added electricity. Uh, after that came Androids. The system at the right, uh, which is from a scion of the family that came up with the showboat, um, was designed so that one person could run a complete system and show everything that was going on in the game. And here's a report on those androids. This is from the Richmond Times. And a little girl is saying, aren't they just the dearest, cutest little fellows you ever saw? And so polite why they bow as sweetly as real live men when they're applauded. And here's the entirety of a story in the New York Times uh, talking about uh, someone proposing to provide Cleveland with these what were called bulletin boards at the time, uh, saying that they are the urgent necessities of life, even if some luxuries have to be omitted. At left is some promotional material for one of the systems. This was the uh, Compton Electric Baseball Bulletin. And at right, just to show you, there's a modern day app for a smartphone to follow a game. They're very, very similar. More innovation happened uh, 1908 to 1913. The Playograph, it was sort of the jumbotron of these systems. So just as people refer to any large screen video image as a jumbotron now, people tended to refer to any large uh, viewing system for baseball as a Playograph. And there's the Jackson Mannequin system and then the Coleman lifelike scoreboard. I'll tell you more about that later. And also the Electroscore. And some of the most popular systems weren't even patented, but there were 44 US patents that were granted for various systems for showing the game. Here's a close up of the Playograph. It actually used a regulation baseball and it was on wires that could move it around. Uh, this is the champion uh, baseball player shown in that Scientific American article. 
Uh, this is backstage at the Coleman Lifelike Scoreboard, the version that used 400 projectors, including a moving projector. And this is what it looked from the looked like from the front of house. So you could see who was batting and who was where on the field and so on. And this is the Noakes Electroscore, and it had 1,500 light bulbs in the field that could actually show the path of the ball wherever it went. This is from the Washington Herald, and this is just one day's newspaper showing five different theaters and the uh, different systems that each theater was using. People would go to these theaters. They went to five different theaters to watch the game in Washington alone. Uh, these are some of the systems you can see. Um, one of them is called the standard ball player. That's because it was uh, invented by somebody at the New Bedford Standard, which was the newspaper there. The star ball player was named for the newspaper, the star, uh, other names that were used. And I like the bottom one, the Rodier Electric uh, baseball game reproducer. And it seems every time that that was mentioned, it had the tagline, which drove Atlantic City wild. Uh, 1921, here is Haywood Brun reporting in Vanity Fair on a conversation between two newsboys who are actually at the game at the polo grounds. And one of them says to the other, gee, what would you give to be in Times Square right now? And there's an editorial in the New York Herald saying that watching an actual game is tame by comparison, uh, that the... Um, scoreboard systems uh, that reproduce the game were like pouring kerosene on your imagination. Oops, seem to be stuck here for a moment. There we go. And it wasn't just the big cities. Uh, in Tucson, Arizona, they would show the game in the Opera House, Laramie, Wyoming, you see the crowd there, Muncie, Indiana, uh, even Waynesburg, Pennsylvania, they came up with their own homebrew system. This is at Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington in 1918. And it wasn't just baseball, there was also the gridograph, so people could follow football games. And then in 1920, we have someone with a radio telephone at the Army-Navy game who is sending the plays that happened at the game to a communication center where it was converted to a Morse code transmission for transmission worldwide. And then that was followed by the first game by somebody actually announcing it by voice. And this was the announcer, Harold Arlen. And it was uh, in Pittsburgh on uh, KDKA and the Pirates defeated the Phillies and it was a disaster. Nobody, I'm not the game was a disaster, but the, um, the radio broadcast of it was a disaster because as Harlan said, nobody told me I had to talk between pitches. So he had not yet picked up that choreography that the telegraphers had figured out for what they were doing in the various theaters. Here's Ronald Reagan, who was a baseball recreator from 1934 to 1937, long before he became president. And he's uh, reporting a baseball game and he's got the information coming in by wire and the wire goes down. And so he's got to report the game, except he doesn't know what's going on in the game. So all he can do is have foul balls. So he keeps having foul ball after foul ball after foul ball until uh, they finally get the wire back up. And this is 1939 in Montrose, Colorado, outside the Daily Press. And again, it's back to just a blackboard where they're putting in the information and no crowds this time because now radio has figured out how to make it exciting. Radio has taken over. The sportscast is solid and away go the theater systems. So uh, that's the origins of the sportscast. I will be happy to entertain any questions. Again, a PDF of these slides is already available at bit.ly slash sc, as in Shubin Cafe hyphen sportscast. And a peer-reviewed fully referenced paper is in the proceedings of the IEEE at bit.ly slash pre hyphen TV. And uh, that's a free link. So you can read that paper. Anyone have any questions? When was the first 
major league sports game broadcast in color? Mm, good question. Um, I think it was in 1951 using the CBS uh, color reel system. From uh, Bill Hayes, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure thing. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Good. How are you, Bill? <laughs> So uh, I was the uh, slide you showed where they had the uh, the supply reel of the film up, and then they did the processing in the van. What mm -hmm. was the delay in that? Um, something on the order of uh, twenty to thirty seconds. Not bad. Very interesting. Yeah, uh, there, there were actually applications of that uh, beyond the sports, so that wasn't an. A totally original thing that they came up with in Germany. Uh, Paramount Pictures was very interested in using television for alternative content in cinemas uh, in the early days, but the they were concerned about video projectors not being good enough, and so they planned that at movie theaters they would actually record the television image on film, process it very quickly, and project it as film. All right, the next question from Deborah Kaufman. Deborah, if you will unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Mark, how are you? Good, how are you, Deborah? Good, thanks. I'm just wondering, I missed the very beginning, so forgive me if this is a repetition, but what other sports were early to broadcasting? And then who were the laggards? <laughs> uh, just about every sport that you can imagine was um, broadcast by BBC between 1937 and 1939. Uh, they didn't do baseball, which was done in the U.S., but they did do archery, they did uh, car racing, they did cricket, they did um, soccer or football, whichever you want to call it. Um, they did swimming, and one thing that I mentioned that you missed is when they did swimming, they actually put the tripod with the camera on it in the swimming pool and had uh, people holding the cable over their heads to get the cable out of the pool without it dropping in the water. All right, thank you, Deborah. Now on to Mark Chillis. Thanks, Michael. Hey, Mark. Thanks for this. Hey, it's always fun to uh, to uh, listen to your historical um, archives. So. Take us into the future. Where are we going next? I, I know that's a tough decision, and especially with COVID, things are moving so quickly. But where do you see, you know, the the future? I'm sure every one of these innovations thought it can't go any further. That's it. Well, the the one future thing that I would like very dearly, uh, I'm not really a, a sports fan so uh, although the supplies to sports and it was developed for sports it's something that I would like to use for opera um, it's the virtual camera and there was a European development uh, called Project Fine and there are some um, videos of it I believe they're on Vimeo but if you search for Project Fine which was um, mm, review something networked environment uh, and I was part of that group they at the end of the project which was in 2012 they set up cameras at the football stadium in Barcelona and it was six little machine vision cameras um, and they were all on the same side of the field and they were all relatively close to one another slightly different heights and slightly different angles. But from just those six cameras, they were able to create a three-dimensional space of the field and the players. And they could then position a camera anywhere in that space, including directly overhead and shooting down at the players that were running around. Um, I've shown that video in some of my talks. You can probably find them online. but. Um, better to, to search for the, the original video and you can see everything. So that's what I'm awaiting uh, very dearly. I would like for there to be a real-time virtual camera system. Cool, thanks.
Thank you, Mark. Moving on to Bill Admins. Bill. Hey, Mark. It's always good to have you do these things. I love the history. Um, I've got an interesting question, you know, with my accent. I'm not always uh, watching baseball. There are other sports, and I'm really interested in when the first cricket match was televised. I believe it was 1937. And was that BBC as well? Yes, that was BBC. If you go to um, that slide, uh, you know, if you go to the uh, Bitly SC Sportscast, you'll get the PDF of the slides. And if you go to the slide that talks about the Wimbledon, uh, I have a link there to that recent um, posting by the Royal Television Society in London. Uh, it was just posted two days ago, but the the whole first half of it uh, it starts with the Berlin Olympics and then goes into all of the outside broadcasting that BBC did uh, 1937 on through the 1948 Olympics. And they do talk about the cricket match in there. Oh, well, wow. thank you. That's going to keep me up at night reading. <laughs> it's about a, an hour and a half presentation, but it's, it's worth it. It's really terrific. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Our next question, and please forgive me if I mispronounce your name, is Rajaswar Susan Thiramani. Yeah, no worries. Hey, uh, Mark, nice to meet you. I'm, this is my first time uh, joining this webinar, this series of webinar. So uh, I think somebody, you talked a little bit about the Olympics. I was curious when the first Olympics was televised. And also, yes, can you talk about... Sorry, now let Go me ahead. just get the question. Yes. Can you also talk about the companies that were involved in the broadcast? Obviously, BBC was one. Was there any other firms that were involved in, uh, you know, sport casting? Just curious. Um, the BBC was not involved in the first Olympics. The first Olympics was the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, the first to be televised. Um, and it was um, a a government um, move, so it was largely the German post office that was coordinating it, but the major uh, German electronics companies, um, AEG, Telefunken, uh, all the ones who had been working in television were there, and I think they also came up cooperated with um, some U.S. companies because their cameras were iconoscope cameras, so that would have been tubes from RCA. It was before the war started. Um, so that was the first one. For the 1948 Olympics, BBC was the coordinator uh, with close cooperation from the British Post Office for transmission. Um, the major companies that were involved were EMI and PI, and uh, BBC actually put in an order for six mobile units from each of them, um, and EMI was able to deliver, uh, PI was not. That's one of the things that you'll find if you look at that Royal Television Society presentation. Absolutely, uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Rogers Warren. Now on to Jeff Wheeler. Jeff, if you'll unmute. Wow. Um, thanks. Oh, gosh, I didn't even know if you could hear me. Hold on. I hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> well, that's one thing working. Um, Mark, thanks, as always, for uh, uh, taking us farther back in, uh, in history than any of us have been able to witness. Um, and, I, and also for touching on the future, I'm wondering um, when HD first came on the scene, I was talking to a, a broadcaster, um, and of course, I, uh, I was all excited about the increase in quality of the image, and uh, his point was that um, broadcasters were smacking their lips over being able to get multiple channels uh, out the door. Um, one HD and three SD or some combination thereof. So I'm wondering why um, multiple camera angles haven't been included in uh, broadcast sports. Um, they have in some cases. Um, <laughs> what's funny, I mentioned that I'd like to have the virtual camera for opera. Um, opera 
was one of the first to have a commercially available system where you could choose a different camera angle. And uh, this was the Vienna State Opera. And in, I think it was 2014, uh, they started transmitting in UHD and they provided a uh, wide shot that you could cut to at any time or you could go with what the director was offering. Um, I think that, uh, you know, beyond having a, a wide shot, a beauty shot or some uh, particular shot of an umpire or something, there may be some issues of uh, shooting the wrong thing at the wrong time and they may be concerned legally, but it's definitely something that uh, various people have experimented with in the past. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking back to um, we had a presentation at IBM Research by Philips about TiVo and um, their uh, stumbling block in developing it, or at least uh, taking it through to uh, a, an absurd length like we've got now. Uh, was the couch potato uh, notion that people had about viewers. That is, you know, it was back, this was the early 90s, so watching television was still pretty much a passive activity. And I'm just wondering if anybody's been doing any work on uh, uh, how excited people would be to, to uh, create their own programming on the spot that way. There have been people who have done work. There was a, a company that was established in Port Washington, New York, specifically to do that kind of thing. Um, but none of it has really taken off. About as close as anyone has gotten, besides this Vienna State Opera thing, was, is um, targeted advertising, where they find out what your interests are. And so if it's an ad for a resort and you happen to like tennis, then it'll tell you about the tennis stuff that's at that resort. And that, there's a recipe for trouble. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you, Jeff. Moving on now to Lynn Rowe. Lynn. Uh, Lynn wants to know what the first live international distributed sports event was. It's me. <laughs> oh, stump Mark Shubin. There you go. Uh, I think it's well, 1964 Tokyo Olympics. No, it was before that because the 1948 Olympics were distributed um, internationally. So um, I don't know. <laughs> it might be the 1948 Olympics. Was satellite distribution. Oh, for yeah. Before. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Moving back to Bill Admins. Bill. Um, yeah, I'm really. I think we lost. Yeah, I pressed my space bar. I went forward. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was I'm interested in the money as well. I'd love to know when um, the leagues first started uh, charging for broadcast rights and, and what the money looked like. Uh, actually, this goes way back to that telegraph era. Um, I mentioned that Western Union was uh, this nationwide service and that the first sports bar, uh, Massey's Billiard uh, Bar in um, St. Louis in, in 1875 was doing half inning uh, play information. Well, Western Union or other telegraph companies would send people out to the ball games to um, start uh, transmitting this stuff. And the um, ball club owners didn't like that. They wanted to get money for it. And so uh, first they would eject them from the park and then uh, they would show up with ladders and stand on a ladder looking over a fence and then they would put up uh, something bigger to prevent them from seeing over the fence. And uh, there's one point where a, a telegraph operator climbed up a, a telegraph line pole and was reporting from that. And so they put up a gigantic um, drop cloth to prevent him from seeing from there. And eventually they came to an accommodation where Western Union did pay some rights to the um, sports uh, clubs. And uh, that was the beginning of changing hands of money. I don't see anything, Mark. Any closing words? Uh, yes, help me get that virtual camera. 